good afternoon ladies and gentlemen dear friends and my dear students we are meeting once again we have a very special guest today and uh, as you have always observed that most of the time whenever we invite our speakers we always learn something new something different so today we have a guest who is also going to teach us so many things and we are going to learn so many things he doesn't need any formal introduction but as a part of the program please allow me to introduce ms rupin sharma dgp borders affairs nagaland mr sharma is a 1992 batch ips officer born on the nagaland cadre he served the state in various capacities as sub divisional police officer additional superintendent of police superintendent of police deputy inspector general cid additional director general of police law and order director general prisons defense before being elevated to the post of director general of police as the dgp of nagaland from 2017 to 18 he brought in massive police reforms and of the police in rule of law and order he has handled anti insurgency operations both pre cease fire and post cease fire and seen the transition of naga insurgent groups to the cease fire and negotiation stages he served in the united nations peacekeeping in bosnia herzegovina and serve as deputy regional commander in the ethnically complex mosta region of bosnia while on deputation to the ministry of external affairs new delhi he handled consular issues like welfare of indians abroad foreigners in india investigation abroad foreign requests to india besides extradition cases both ways mr sharma has dealt with all aspects of international cooperation in criminal matters from within police to cbi interpol and also from ministry of external affairs to an indian mission embassy abroad giving him a unique experience while in cbi he served as assistant director interpol responsible for all international coordination including investigation and extradition matters arrest of mumbai gangster abu salem in portugal was among the better known of his catches he had served in the nda cbi and indian embassy in Venezuela, and has a thorough overview of the entire extradition process and international cooperation in criminal matters sir sharma we are really blessed to have with you today uh, sir is going to talk about policing in nagaland the backdrop observations concerns and solutions very complex subject yet we believe we are going to learn a lot sir i request you to take the charge uh, of this wonderful stage and please take your time thank you so much sir stage is yours uh, thank you Uh, thank you uh, mr anurud and uh, also thanks to uh, colonel joy choudhury for having sounded me in advance about uh, the program and the invite uh, a few things before i want uh, before i want to start uh, on the topic uh, firstly uh, i would uh, be happy to answer any questions or queries Uh, which may crop up in anyone's mind uh, to the best of my knowledge and opinion i may not necessarily be true in all cases but it is going to be my opinion uh, secondly it will be good if we can keep the questions towards the end although i don't mind anyone intervening me in between uh, to raise any question but it will be good if we can keep the questions towards the end uh meanwhile uh, you could also send the questions in the chat box uh, write it down in the chat box uh, however the only caveat in the chat box is that uh, after the end of my uh, talk i would have to list uh, to go back and uh, read all the questions and uh, again answer the queries uh i'm grateful to dr anirudh babar for the introduction uh i don't again claim to be an expert neither on the policing nor on uh, the customary laws and uh, practices in nagaland however if any examples that i am giving 
even if they are like slightly out of context it's not because i want to malign anyone or uh cast any prejudices on anyone but these are examples which would probably help us to explain better uh things which exist uh, in the society uh they are not uh, say always true examples uh, although some of them can be true examples but uh, some of them would be like sort of fictional examples of things uh policing as we understand is uh, is a fairly old, old concept however the modern uh, aspects of policing are not very old uh traditionally historically policing has, has existed in some form of the or, or the other ever from the uh, from the beginning of the inception of the society uh, because uh, when people settled down uh, into groups into families and smaller groups and the villages and the clans etc there was some uh, form of uh, norms or group behavior which started getting defined and to implement those forms of behavior within a group that group could be a family or could be a, a neighborhood or could be a clan or a tribe or a village or a set of villages to a district or a country or international norm so uh, whenever there were groups certain forms of behavior started getting defined and it was essential that uh, those forms of behavior get implemented so to implement uh, those behaviors in the society there was some mechanism which was required now traditionally there were no mechanisms like a policing the behavioral norms in a society were regulated by those so called quote unquote elders in the society elders in a village or elders in a group uh, actually these were elders these were these were not necessarily always uh, the wiser people in the group but those were elders in the group because it was the elders who would be able to impart uh, to people down the generations what was the norm which was originally conceived of and what was the what was the context in which that norm was conceived of now as we would uh, understand that since groups def, uh, developed separately most of the groups traditionally like hundreds of thousands of years ago uh, developed in isolation most of the groups started interacting with each other to some extent but they developed in isolation and when they developed in isolation it was but natural that their norms also developed in isolation uh, if not in isolation from the rest of the world but at least in isolation from uh others which were too distant from them distant as in geographically distant from them this also meant that people living in a certain area had more similarity than people living in different areas in different parts of the world or the country this is where i again uh, uh again and again say that between people living in nagaland and the northeast of india there is more commonality between them and the people living in the myanmar side of the border uh, there is more commonality between the punjabis i am not saying punjabis as in sikhs but punjabis as in the people who speak punjabi language there is more commonality more in common between people who are living in both sides of the border in punjab and rajasthan and sindh and gujarat uh, with their counterparts in pakistan than they have with their counterparts in nagaland so this is how societies have developed this is how norms have developed so people who are living in contiguous areas have more in common people who are living in areas which are closer to each other have more in common than people living in different distinct parts of the world or in the country uh this partly also explains why there is a distinctness of cultures there is a distinct and unique culture and historic uh, um, uh and uh, a unique identity of people over uh, 
which people have preserved over a period of time. That preservation of identity, uh, in my view, is on account of two things. One is on account of the relative geographical isolation of people living in a particular area. And second is the other part of the continuum, the relative uh, interactivity, interaction and exposure of the same group of people with other people in their surroundings or other parts of the world. For example, Nagaland and the tribes in Nagaland have more to, sh more to share in common with others in the rest of the country. This is partly, particularly, again, because they have lived, these tribes have lived in ge uh, relative geographical isolation uh, till about, uh, say, 150 years ago, say, before the advent of the Christian missionaries, uh, probably about 40, 50 years before that, there was hardly any interaction of the tribes with others. I would actually be surprised if there were interaction of the tribes in Nagaland with the uh, uh, any other communities outside Nagaland. Uh, there may have been a certain degree of interaction with people within their own tribes and within the Naga inhabited areas or the tribal areas, but there was perhaps very little interaction with people in other parts of the uh, country. Uh, this was one of the reasons why the society uh, grew up the way it is, how the customs and the traditions got preserved, and how the customs and traditions and the customary laws exist the way they are now. So uh, historically also, the basic instinct of all human beings, uh, including Nagaland, was preservation of uh, the self. The preservation of the self gave way to preservation of a community or a group which was initially the family, and then it became the village or the clan. Uh, much, much later, the tribe and the district or the uh, country or whatever, the state or the country that we think of now. Uh, in Nagaland, and in most of the tribal societies in India's Northeast, and perhaps in all the societies world over, where there have been tribal societies which have existed much in isolation from the rest of the society around them, these things, these uh, features are common. Most of these societies are very inward looking with the basic instinct of preserving themselves. So the preservation of identity, the, the, the feeling of preservation of identity, uh, the so-called uh, the will to preserve the identity is most in a family, followed by that in a village, because it is in a village that people would uh, would want to uh, come together, stay together, and live together. So in the current state of Nagaland, where we see things that uh, the village identity is still the strongest identity of a of an individual. It is not a tribal identity. The tribal identity probably comes second. The first is the village identity. I mean, I would I would not be uh, uh, perhaps going too far to say that the primary identity is the village identity. It is not even the family identity. In Nagaland, the primary identity is the village identity. And this uh, primariness of the village identity is not so only in Nagaland, but it is also in uh, most other tribal societies. Uh, it is this village identity which becomes a macro identity which takes the shape of a range identity or a uh, tribe-wise uh, identity, and later on it uh, takes the shape of a district identity as we call it now. Uh, in all these societies, the norms have developed, uh, as I said earlier, but Nagaland is a case in point where the norms have developed, but the primary uh, driving force for the norms to develop is the preservation of the group identity as in a village. So the village identity remains the strongest. So it is the village which 
controls the behavior of an individual so initially uh, there was there was no policing there was hardly any policing worth it as i said in the rest of the society also wherever there were kings in nagaland perhaps we didn't see kings at all uh, but in the rest of the country and the world wherever there were kings there too there was no policing the the function of policing uh, was largely absent policing i mean policing in the modern sense of the term the function of policing was largely absent the function of policing was only to preserve the state so since it was the function of policing was to preserve the identity of the state or the borders of the state and the king uh, it was the army and the armed forces which was the most important element for uh, uh, for maintenance of law and order because it was not policing but it was protection of the borders of the state and protection of the identity of the state so if there is any theft or anything it was not the dgp or the igp or the superintendent of police or the oc who was to be called into a service uh, to catch a criminal no it was the senapati the army commander who would be uh, called in to perform that function so all crimes were looked upon as crimes against the state which actually still continues means uh, in a modern sense of the state uh, of the term even today all crimes which are getting prosecuted uh, one of the parties is the state the state has taken over the role of the uh, individual once the person gets caught so that thing is preserved however the only difference is that in the ancient times in the earlier times all crimes were dealt with by a different mechanism which was the army it was not the police so the first uh, sort of roots of policing started getting established in say around 13th century uh, where some sort of a kotwal started getting established the first police stations in india started getting established in the 80 in the 17th century like around 7 to 1680 which was in chennai and uh, mumbai um, it was only later after the first war of uh, independence which the britishers call it the mutiny it was only after 1857 that uh, offenses started getting defined and policing or police as we saw it as we see it today started getting any shape it was in 1861 that the first uh, formal mechanism of policing started getting set up with the uh, uh, inaction or the legislation of the indian police act in 1861 <laughs> now coming closer home to uh, nagaland uh, policing in nagaland sort of precedes uh, policing in some other parts of the country and even the britishers although it is not as the same uh, nature the treaty of yandapo in 1826 gave rise to some sort of a civil police mechanism some sort of a mechanism although it is not was not the mechanism that we see today and then in uh, uh, again cl uh, closer back home the first police station in nagaland as we see today the first police station was set up in uh, 18 in 1933 uh, which was in kohima the north police station kohima is the oldest police station in nagaland which was set up in uh, 1933 uh the second police station probably was the one in dimapur east police station dimapur which was in uh, 1961 now in the rest of the country police stations or kotwalis were set up in 19th century it is like 1861 onwards there were some police stations set up in nagaland it was 18 uh, in 1933 so we are quite recent and imagine that now that in nagaland we have almost 81 80 80 odd police stations but about 70 80 years ago 80 years ago there was only one police station to look after nagaland so 
things were different then the uh, population was less areas were far flung so there were many reasons why policing was non existent in nagaland but uh, there was only one police station and therefore the uh, function of policing is new to nagaland uh, with this as the background uh, of policing in general and touching upon how it came to nagaland when it came to nagaland uh, another factor which is important is the rules for administration of justice in nagaland uh, the assam government in 1937 formulated these rules uh, most of the rules continue uh, in those rules since they were made pre independence period and uh, there was the old uh, criminal procedure code some of those have not been revised to bring them in conformity with the existing law so there are some gaps which still exist uh, but along with that there is the aspect that those rules provide for a definition of police uh as per the rules for administration of justice nagaland police police in nagaland or the naga hills is divided into two parts it is the urban police and the rural police the urban police interestingly comprises of police as well as the assam rifles uh and the rural police comprises of all the uh, gaon budas and mozadars and chokidars etc now uh, this was this was again a revelation to me that assam uh, that assam rifles is categorized as police in nagaland uh, however i'm not on this count that it is police but uh, we must understand that the backdrop of policing in nagaland is slightly different uh, except for the first police station which is 1933 uh, all other all other police stations or police setups uh, in nagaland were actually started to counter insurgency in some form or the other whether it is through assam rifles or through the assam police uh, they were all through armed police so therefore we have seen that there is a burgeoning in the growth of the armed police battalions and the presence of armed police in nagaland is much more than the presence of the civil police uh, this probably is the trend throughout the country but uh, in nagaland this is very different and uh, with uh, and the armed police battalions uh, take the uh, cake the larger piece of the cake in policing in nagaland uh, my considered view is that armed police battalions throughout the country wherever they exist are just to aid the civil administration which is the civil police and the district administration they they do not uh, do any policing as such uh, on their own uh their powers of policing sometimes they are defined sometimes they are not their powers in, of policing and their uh, effectiveness uh is limited by the extent to which the civil police and the district administration is able to extract work from them uh in uh, in nagaland this this explains why there is a lot of assam rifles in nagaland uh, traditionally uh, this also explained why there are 15 armed police battalions in nagaland uh, and there are lesser number of people posted in the police districts in nagaland uh, now part of the reason could be besides fighting insurgency could be that there are uh, there have been uh, clashes between people between villages into uh, with, within villages between two villages between groups of people where you will need a uh, uh, higher quantity of armed police to counter the uh, uh, what, what should i say the rebels or the rioting parties you would need a high quantity of police there uh, so that is why you would need uh, armed police but uh arm police just goes in there whether it is arm police uh, of, of the state government or the arm police which is the assam rifles because uh i have seen through my experience in nagaland that uh, 
it is the assam assam rifles which is uh, having a very good uh, hold on the people which is having a very good uh, idea about the population in the area and they are very quick to intervene because their resources are better than uh, the nagaland police um, so assam police uh, the assam rifle is of a lot of help to all of us uh, in nagaland but because um, these these clashes can erupt anywhere therefore uh, we traditionally had a higher number of uh, armed police battalions but you know this is uh, this is slightly unfortunate uh, uh, where uh, we send in larger number of people uh, holds of people holds of people uh, by way of armed police battalions or by way of uh, assam rifles to quell uh, disturbances whether it is between uh, uh, villages or between communities or just between uh, two groups of people without any affiliations to any village or anything uh, these are just uh, band-aid measures these are just temporary measures to bring peace to that area the the real strong arm of law is not the armed police sorry the real strong arm of law is not the armed police the armed police is only the danda it is it is only going to instill a temporary degree of fear and uh, uh, and separate the warring parties or the warring uh, groups uh, from each other so as to temporarily bring peace uh, in a right situation the the real policing is going to come in where between two warring groups or two uh, combatant uh, groups of people where the police station where the sp and the courts get hold of the people who initiated a riot or created a problem or committed a crime and they are punished for that act so that there is a lesson drawn by others also uh, to the best of my knowledge i haven't heard of any instances where people involved in a riot in nagaland have ever got a punishment i may be mistaken but i have not seen of any documented cases where people involved in riots have got punished for instances of rioting between two villages or two clans or between uh, two tribes on account of any issue whatsoever i have been witnessing uh, riots or clashes between uh, angamis and i had been witnessing it in, in the sense that when i first came to nagaland in 95 uh, there were large clashes huge clashes almost erupting on a weekly basis between uh, uh, my sema and uh, angami friends uh, in the ranga pahad forest area uh, just because one of them would want to take the land which other things that it belongs to him uh, uh, historically so the the angami is used to allege that uh, or used to think that uh, that la land in raga pahad area is angami traditional land whereas the semas would want to have it for reasons best known to the semas uh, we used to go there and intervene and separate the two groups we used to inter intervene and destroy the houses or the hutments built by both the communities we used to arrest a large number of people now when i am saying we it means police and that police includes police station staff as well as the crpf we used to have a large number of crpf people those days we used to have nagaland police nagaland armed police also but we used to have a large number of crpfs we used to catch the uh, angami and sema settlers settlers if you would uh, call them uh, in those words we used to call um, catch them bring them to the village uh, to the police station which was like the fupar police station those days it was sometimes in terms of hundreds i remember one day we had caught on almost 200 or people uh end of the day we would catch them arrest them keep them in custody for a day next day or they would be produced before a magistrate they would get bailed out but even from those cases from 95 to 97 i would be surprised if any one of those who were arrested by the police for either writing or a month uh 
squatting on a property or anything would have been punished for any offense the result was since a criminal act is not being taken to its logical conclusion because by way of punishment the deterrence of the law is not there so nobody is afraid of getting caught because the repercussions for him in legal terms are very less so this this more or less has spread to the entire state it it's it's a situation which exists in most parts of the state there are uh, even among the yemchungar and chang clashes and the simi sitmi in uh, kifuri district i yes there are people who are caught but uh, they are temporarily caught as in under trial prisoners and um, uh, then they get bailed out after a month or two months or three months and after that i, mean, I would be surprised in fact i would be happily surprised to know if any trials have started and anyone has got punishment so what what i mean to say is that the armed police which exists has become the face of policing which actually is not the face of policing i mean i'm not saying anything against armed police i'm saying the real face of policing is the real duty of policing is to catch a criminal one is the preventive aspect the other is to catch a criminal and take it to the logical conclusion which is to get him punished for the offense which he has done according to the law uh so there are there are gaps and these gaps exist because uh, uh in in our society again again no no aspersions no casting of aspersions on anyone any tribe or any person but uh in in nagaland most people are still living in a divided world uh, our our allegiances are divided between whether we should follow the traditional customary law and practices or whether we should go to the normal codified laws as per the as per the constitution of india the the indian constitution gives enough protection to the to the safeguards the customary laws and practices and traditions of nagas there is no doubt about that but there are gaps because of that there are gaps which uh, which have an impact on the administration and on the development of the society as such uh, there is there is a need to have an um, uh have a look at uh, how things function again not necessarily in cha- by changing customary laws but you know by having a system where a dispute resolution mechanism is much better where people start getting punished for the wrongs i'll give you a very small example uh, uh, yes this can be extrapolated to anything which is a recent case but i'll let me take it from my days as sgpo in dimapur so as i said that those days due to the ranga pahad forest uh, encroachment campaign we used to catch a lot of people so imagine that in a in a, over a 3 months period we caught around say 700 800 people from from both communities now end of the day they just start getting bailed uh, say whether it is within 24 hours or 26 or, or say uh, 10 days or 20 days or a month they all start getting bailed out they all they all would have got bailed out none of them would have faced punishments i am very sure if there were 1000 people who were arrested at least 4 500 of them would be in the government jobs now now my point is very simple if the law had taken its course and if there had been an adverse police report against them they would not have got a job once they had not got a job it would have been an effective deterrent for the rest of the people in the society not to commit that same wrong again this is where the strong arm of law works in a very soft manner by setting an example that if you do something wrong that wrong will come to haunt you in due course of time it is not the danda alone it is how the law will impact you so just to make things clearer again uh on this count only so 1000 people were arrested say over a period of say 5 months 6 months whatever or say 2 months most of them get bailed out 
five of them, five hundred of them apply for a job and get a job. You know, if we do a police verification and the police verification says that he has been arrested in this case, it is no bar to him getting a job. You know, it doesn't say that you will not get a job, but that adverse police report will serve as a deterrent. This is what I am trying to say. Even the governments will be will be pushed and prodded to make um, uh, sort of some rules as to what will be the basic uh, parameters um, of police and anti-incidents verification for a person to apply for a job or for not to be given a job. So this will help. And if imagine that if this had happened in 95 to 97 when I was SDPO and a similar system would have been followed in the state over a period of next 25 years, next 25 years, how smooth things would have been because we would have made people more and more law abiding without beating up anybody, without uh, torturing anybody, but just by showing them that law is important and there is a need for you to follow the law. Uh, this is where I also say that there are uh, gaps in, in policing and those gaps are because just one second, please. This is where I say that there are gaps, but uh, those gaps are not filled because we do not take things to the logical conclusion. We just abandon things uh, midway. Uh, you know, again, uh, no ill will towards anyone, neither in the government nor to the underground. Uh, in the early 1990s, drug, drug addiction was at its peak in Nagaland. You know who the people were more afraid of? Were they afraid more of the government or the undergrounds? They were more afraid of the undergrounds. Why? Because the undergrounds had adopted a hard approach. They were, I was told that they were chopping off the ears of people who were drug addicts. They would not have chopped off ears of every drug addict, but it was just the message that got sent, even if they had done it for two, three people, that this is something which will not be tolerated. And the drug addicts came down. On the other hand, the state, which is the softer arm of law, which is the authority, we firstly were not able to catch hold of the addicts. If we were able to catch hold of the addicts, we were not able to treat them properly. We were not able to catch hold of the people who were supplying the drugs. We were not able, to, if we were able to catch hold of the people who were supplying the drugs, we were not able to get them punished for various reasons, including forensic reasons or lack of evidence to the witnesses turning hostile and so many other things. The, the drug addiction in Nagaland only came down by a trickle because after a while, the undergrounds and the police also start getting uh, women start coming in conflict with each other if the underground chops up the ear for ear of a person who is a drug addict the police will not keep idle the police will register a case uh, of grievous hurt of grievous injury so the underground stopped doing it and the police was only registering a case of of a crime against an underground who was chopping off the ear it was with good intent but it was it was criminal act in any case. But the police was in a way failing in its job of arresting those criminals and uh, getting them punished. So there were gaps because of these gaps, because we were catching less number of criminals, which we, because we were not able to get everybody, everybody punished. Uh, again, the gaps kept increasing. So this is where our uh, systems started having gaps. Then, then there was the issue of uh, which we often say in Nagaland, where like a lot of instances uh, of smaller crimes like theft and all, they get resolved at the village level. You know, to people of uh, uh, somebody who's stolen something, and the village council and the uh, Gampuras or the village court sit together and ask him to give, uh, say, five hundred rupees or a uh, 
Gauri or whatever, you know, it gets sorted out. Now, I have no problem in uh, crimes being solved uh, in that manner. However, two issues. Firstly, what is the amount of punishment that a village court can uh, give? That is the first issue. Uh, as per my, my knowledge and as per my uh, understanding of the rules of justice, the punishment cannot exceed 500 rupees. If it cannot exceed 500 rupees, I would be surprised if it is interpreted to mean that uh, the punishment would be one pig because the cost of the pig would be much more than 500 rupees. So that is the first anomaly in in the situation. Uh, uh, if you if you uh, were to handle crimes in a traditional manner, the second is even if a crime is to be handled in a traditional manner in a village. Now, with, with modern uh, developments in communications and transport, what is the guarantee that the same person, after committing a crime in one village and having given a pig as repentance, does not go to another village and commit a similar crime or, a same, or the same crime elsewhere? Because after all, if he's given a pig as a fine, he's incurred a loss. To recover his loss, if he is criminally minded, he will go to some other place and recover his money. So there are there are issues. I, I have no problems about the village courts uh, uh, administering justice if it is uh, uh, according to traditional law. You know, but again, administering justice as per traditional uh, uh, law and as per customary laws is a very is a, is a very tricky subject. Uh, it could it. I mean, one could uh, discuss this topic alone uh, over many sessions. Uh, one of the aspects, again, that I would bring, bring out is like, in which cases would the traditional customary law apply? Would it apply to all cases of theft? Or only to traditional, or, or only to cases of theft which are of a traditional nature? Uh, let me explain this a bit. Why? What I mean by uh, these two? If it was to apply to all cases of theft, which is like theft as a concept, then it will also apply to theft of a mobile phone. It will. It would probably also apply to theft of a password. It will also apply to theft of money from a bank through an electronic transaction or a Google Pay or it would also apply to, uh, say, uh, theft of money or may, maybe breach of trust of money uh, by sending a fake uh, Facebook link or a WhatsApp link for them to, say, steal money from your account. That is one aspect. So, or would it only apply or should it only apply to theft of articles which were in traditional usage in the past, which means which were in traditional usage in the village, which again, I would clarify would be household utensils, household goods, uh, maybe maybe liquor or uh, modu if people were making it. No, only things or, or say uh, paddy or crops or vegetables in the fields, it would not necessarily apply to all cases of thefts. Now, my understanding or my request to people in Nagaland and people in say tribal societies uh, like Nagaland elsewhere in the country would be, if you apply traditional customary laws to theft as a concept, it will be very, very difficult for us to survive and to progress uh, because this is a concept which is riddled with prob problems. You cannot apply, for example, you cannot apply the, tradition, the traditional concept of theft as a concept to theft of a password. How, how can you justify? Yes, it is theft, but there was, there was no password which existed in a mobile phone or a laptop, say, uh, 25, 30 years ago. There was no such thing which existed 35 years ago. Now, how can you apply the traditional concept of a theft to something which did not exist traditionally? So, 
the traditional concepts of customary law and practices in my view should apply to only items traditionally existing in the society as and when new and more items started getting added those concepts of theft and of traditional laws and customary laws would at some point of time start getting redundant it would not be uh, relevant so yes you preserve the customary law you preserve your traditions there is no harm in doing that i am all for preservation of all those customs but by doing that by applying those traditional customary laws and custom customs do not allow yourselves to become museums or laughing stock for others you know or governments or you know in another way means allow the miscarriage of justice to take place uh, for example like uh, in the village councils or the village development boards there was no money coming in this village development councils thing is well, only about 60 years ago it the the village development council that we vdc is that we see today they were not traditional they were not traditional in concept they were they did not exist through ages in a hereditary manner so if there is embezzlement or if there is theft taking place or if there is forgery taking place or someone is making money out of that it will be very difficult for you people for people in nagaland to apply the traditional concepts of traditional customary laws and practices to solve those problems but how, how for example would you um, solve a problem where someone has uh, siphoned off say 40 50 lakh rupees uh, from a whatever xyz fund in a village to make his own house or to purchase a car or something and he's caught and then he's given a punishment of only up to 500 rupees or he's asked to give say 200 uh, um, or he's uh, asked to give say a few pigs recently in uh, i mean you've seen that um, uh, on the facebook which i also saw it on facebook and uh, you know, whatsapp uh, one of the villages that i think uh, lankum village uh, the fine imposed was 200 pigs uh, i'm not i'm not uh, uh, going into the merits of the case but 200 pigs is a fine which could be easily termed as disproportionate you know so we have to look at things in a different manner i mean uh, uh, the 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 progress of the society the change cannot be stopped by me or you uh, we have to look at it in a progressive manner so what i'm saying is that there are, there are problems um, in the way things exist today uh, the solution lies in looking ahead uh, all the modern laws which have been enacted most of the modern laws which are being enacted have not been enacted have not been made with a view to trivialize anyone with a view to show anyone in a bad light with a view to harm anybody anyone in particular most of the laws are universal in nature they are meant to apply to most people a lot of people it is not that the law is only made for rupin sharma no it is made for all people who are in the category of rupin sharma or all people in india it is not made for nagaland only there are yes there are specific laws but most of the laws are not like that sorry uh then we come to the village level uh, uh, no no uh, let me touch on the last part of it the what can be done the solutions part of it you know uh what what can be done how do we integrate the policing in nagaland and make it more modern how how we can do it now there is no doubt that there is a there is a traditional mechanism which exists and there is a modern mechanism which exists uh the traditional mechanism uh has sort of uh, taken over the role of the modern mechanism in a lot of places uh a lot of disputes are getting resolved at the traditional level which is which is which is correct which is uh, uh, not something wrong yes uh, dispute resolution alternate dispute resolution mechanism need to be worked out and it should be vibrant 
but there should be limits defined as to what they can do and what they cannot do. Uh, uh, another issue, uh, aspect of this is like, uh, have, have we, have people in Nagaland got the faith enough in the police? It would be a very interesting study for someone to do as to what is the proportion of cases registered in Nagaland by Nagas as well as non-Nagas. Uh, I have a feeling that a disproportionately higher number of cases with the police are registered by non-Nagas than by the Nagas. I, I cannot explain the phenomenon, but one of the reasons can be less, tra less trust on the police. Uh, traditionally, I'm, I'm again, it's it's not because of any leadership or anything, but because there are traditional mechanism, alternate uh, mechanism which exists. So one of the reasons is that people have um, people think that it is much easier to go to the uh, alternate mechanisms than to come to the police. However, those alternate alternate dispute resolution mechanisms are not sacrosanct. I have I have seen cases I know of cases where alternate dispute resolution mechanisms are making money out of uh, dispute resolution. They are not entitled. Their whatever resolution of disputes takes place through their interference has no meaning at all in the eyes of law. However, it is done without any value. It is done, and it is done by. Uh, sort of uh, uh, by not even consulting or not even reporting to the police or the administration. Now, since I've now come to the point of reporting, now one of the easiest ways of sorting out a lot of these problems is, especially the from the village level uh, uh, courts. Now, the village level courts, uh, the Bashi courts and the uh, uh, Gamburas and all, they have some sort of an official sanctity as per the laws in Nagaland. Uh, however, there is no integration mechanism between the village level courts and the policing, the official policing. So therefore, uh, what needs to be done is that all cases and all matters which are decided or referred to by the village courts, they need to maintain records. These records after proper maintenance, these records and the decisions need to be conveyed to the local police and the district administration. I have visited a few village courts and the DV courts, uh, Dubashi courts and the Gambura courts. They do maintain a sort of a sketchy register uh, where not too many details are written. Uh, very few details are written. Um, sometimes the decision is written, most of the time it is not. It's, so it's working on the basis of the memory of the people who are handling it. Even if the records are maintained, the, those records are not shared with the local police. Now, this is the simplest thing which can be done in Nagaland, is that all the uh, documentation which is uh, being done by the village courts or the village police, which is the Gaubudas and the Mozadars and the Chokidas and all, they, these need to be shared with the police. This will help because this will help create a uh, statewide database of uh, 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 of criminals or people who are deviants in their behavior, and 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 as I said in the Ranga Pahad case, this will help act as a deterrent for others, because if 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 a village or if an authority knows that people have created a problem in some place, people other in other places can watch out for these uh, uh, deviants. Uh, you know, in, in Nagaland, for all these things and a lot of more things to be done, I think uh, there are a few basic things which uh, need to be done among the solutions is like, uh, I think, although the law provides for a lot of powers, they give law decentralizes a lot of powers to the village courts and all. However, the village courts and all are not too much aware of their rights and their duties. Uh, rights as in what is the power that they can exercise and duties as in 
what is the reporting structure like if something goes do- goes wrong what do they do and whom they have to report to and under what circumstances they have to report matters either to the deputy commissioner or to the police or to the judicial magistrate so the first thing is i think we need to have a uh, training mechanism we need to train the people the people in the village courts and the village authorities about uh, how the criminal justice system and the policing structure in nagaland works this will help this will help nagaland police and this will also help maintain a good degree of uh, law and order and peace in the state uh second is rationalization of manpower this i have also touched upon uh, a bit um, we have uh, in nagaland police we have too many people among uh, in the armed police battalions we have a decent number of people in the village guards uh, all, almost 9000 people in the village guards uh, and we also have about say 1200 1300 people in the home guards which are all auxiliary uh security uh, forces i think there is a need to rationalize uh, this manpower uh, there is a need to uh, strengthen the police stations which is where the uh, policing should commence from uh, along with this uh, is that uh, the village guards you know a uh, currently the village guards are only from the local villages and uh, most of them perform duty in a very ad hoc manner i think there is a need for uh, strengthening this uh, village guards uh, organization uh, giving them more powers training them uh, on the what what are the duties they can perform uh, so that they can be used uh, in a policing uh, environment in a better manner i think there is also a very strong case for um, giving powers of special police officers under the police act to the uh, village guards so that they can carry out the policing functions in the uh, in their own villages uh you know then uh, the the requirement for creating an uh, awareness among the public in nagaland Uh, that alternate dispute resolution mechanisms uh, including those which are invoked because of the undergrounds or various unions or tribal hoos or apex bodies or villages uh, or the village bodies are not official mechanisms uh, they can be useful only uh, to a limited extent the the official mechanisms mechanisms which are uh, instituted by the state government are the ones which Uh, people need to uh, have more trust upon uh basically uh, the the last part of it i would want to say is that in nagaland uh yes nagaland is different in the sense that every um, every district uh, is formed on a prob- I mean, most districts are formed on tribal lines and uh, there is one particular language which is prevalent uh, so you would ideally want uh, an officer from your own tribe to be heading the district however officers from uh, the same tribe uh, whether it is the sp or the oc or the sdpo they have their own constraints because they get swayed by the local emotions and uh, uh, and their own allegiances to their own people or their clan or the village uh, which could actually prejudice uh, policing in in some states uh, in in the country in fact in most states in the country uh, it is forbidden for a person to be posted to his home district or his home police station it is just about time that in nagaland we should start thinking of uh, a mechanism where probably except for kohima and uh, dimapur in all other places people should not be posted to their home uh, districts or the home police stations or subdivisions uh, in a capacity where they can influence decisions uh, i mean i can tell you that in uh, in punjab and haryana you can be posted to your own district as a as a commandant of a battalion but you cannot be posted as a tc or an sp uh, this is because again in those uh, states 
it is the sp which is more important than the commandant a commandant is a is a subsidiary job however in nagaland it's just the reverse so in if you were to supplant a similar philosophy in nagaland you will say that uh, sps and dcs sps dcs and commandants need not be posted in their home districts um, and similarly an oc cannot be posted to his home police station i think these are these are small things which will uh, help uh, uh, help policing in nagaland uh, i think i am done now um, i would be happy to take any questions if there are any so thank you so much for your enlightening talk of course there will be question so let me take one question which has uh, come in the chat box uh, from uh, professor s elika asumi uh, she asks uh, in the larger context of the nation the tag of police brutality is now closely subscribed to the police force also today in the context of nagaland we find the term we find that the long arm of the law is rather a mockery due to the implicit police corruption isn't it given this perspective how do you think the reparations and trust with from the community and the people can begin sir your technique yeah alika uh, see the long arm of uh, law in nagaland uh, in nagaland's context uh, is a mockery not not probably because of corruption itself uh corruption can be a secondary factor uh, i think the primary factor is uh, our not being able to assert ourselves you know uh, uh, a policeman in the in the worst case uh, scenario a policeman will make money will be corrupt if he does something if he doesn't do something if he is not acting against a criminal how can he be corrupt you know in a case where he is not acting uh, the only corruption that you can expect from him is like sitting at home and taking a salary so on that aspect like yes some i mean you will have black sheep uh, but there are redressal mechanisms for handling those black sheep uh, 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 i i can assure you that if there are instances of police officers making uh, uh, for indulging in corrupt practices if those corrupt, uh, practices are highlighted brought to the notice of senior officers i am sure that action would be taken some action would definitely be initiated against the officers uh, there are dep departmental proceedings and uh, departmental uh, procedures according to which people can be taken to task uh the second part is uh, yes how can you bring bring uh, trust with the community you know uh, trust with the community again comes with action on the part of police you know uh, if if police does not act if uh, there is no work done by the police how will you expect people to come to the police you know again nothing against nagaland police as such it's the structure of uh, nagaland the socio economic and development structure of nagaland where most of the policing in nagaland takes place in only three four areas which is like timapur kohima mokokchung and probably tensang in rest of the state there is hardly any policing which takes place uh when I mean, policing is in the in the manner of uh, crime uh, uh, dealing with crime and criminals no there are police stations in the state where we don't have more than 10 uh, fir's registered in a year and there are about say 20 people posted in a year including say uh, two two sub inspectors uh, you know if there are two sub inspectors in a police station and there are just 10 cases in a year you are just having a workload of five cases to be investigated in a year by a, by a police officer if there are only five cases which are being registered in a police station jurisdiction which means that the level of his interaction with the public is very very low i would not say poor because poor can be misconstrued but the level of his interaction with the public is very very low this level of interaction is on account of two things 
firstly that people do not have the trust to come to him that lack of trust can be because people are not aware of the mechanism or the police station is far away from the uh, from the place of occurrence of the crime or there are alternate dispute resolution mechanisms so those could be some of the factors there could also be lack of trust because this person the gentleman or the set of officers or the set of office, uh, set of people in the police station are not reaching out to the public they are not reaching out to the public for either for policing work or for anything else if we do not go around and mix with people as policemen if we do not go around and mix with people we will lose out on a lot of information we will lose out on a lot of vital information which could easily get converted into a larger crime tomorrow so my request and my suggestion to uh, the public is go and report more and more to the public uh, to the police once you go more, uh, go and report more and more to the public you will realize that police is not uh, as bad as it is even in nagaland it is it is probably nagaland police that way man to man is much better than police in other in other parts of the country uh, but if you do not go you will not realize that police is not bad on the other hand it is also incumbent on the police officers to go and reach out to the public and tell them that we are there for you you can approach us and you can uh, trust us with being fair in whatever you do so i i think this beginning can be made more in the rural police station in the rural areas where the number of cases registered is very less because it is in those police station jurisdictions where the police officers have the time to go out to the villages go and interact with people or students or women or various people from various cross sections of the society to handle or to approach them if there is something which is wrong uh i think it uh, it will take a bit of um, guided initiative uh, guided from the top an initiative which is uh, taken by the ground formations in the nagaland police but it has to be effectively monitored at the top so that people start going out reaching out to others and interacting with people i hope i am able to satisfy uh, elika on this call next please uh, sir uh, let me uh, let me just uh, intervene uh, sure. you know uh, in 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 your uh, arguments yes uh, when when we think about uh, corruption yeah there is a visible corruption and uh, there is invisible corruption yeah please right what what we normally understand about a uh, visible corruption is basically you know something to deal with monetary transactions mm -hmm. but as you rightly mentioned uh, when we think about you know uh, the tribal angle or tribalism or mm -hmm. favoritism mm -hmm. or you know having allegiance to the own tribe and which is yeah. subsequently having impact on the basic functionality of uh, police. the police officer mm -hmm. okay so somewhere i i am compelled to understand this entire complex situation also under the term of corruption so mm -hmm. uh, sir what, how, how are we going to tackle that particular point because see on one hand it is your clan on one hand it is your tribe mm -hmm. on the other hand it is the constitution of india mm -hmm. on the other hand it is the police act and the manual so yeah. how how a police officer needs to look at this situation wherein he could uh, provide the proper services to the people yeah i understand what you're saying i mean i would i would not say those are like those that is corruption but yes on a very larger broader framework it macro thing it may be corruption but i would call it prejudices i think those prejudices should be tackled i have no doubt in saying that those prejudices should be tackled if you would recollect towards the end of my uh, talk i mentioned about uh, postings and transfers where people should not be posted to their home areas and home jurisdictions i think that is one point where a beginning can be made uh, you know if if i am in nagaland and i am from himachal pradesh i have no stakes in nagaland for me and now and an angami or a sema or a konyak is all all of them are the same but if i get posted to my home district or my home uh, uh, state i would have deep rooted interest somewhere someone will either know me or i will know someone no 
in such a situation it is very very difficult to maintain a degree of neutrality i i, I recollect when I, i was under training in himachal as a probationer officer i used to face these problems however you have to rise above the parochial levels i mean firstly it is upon the officer that he should be able to rise above those levels now since in nagaland our systems are weak in that regard you know in the sense that mostly we we tend to post officers to their home districts people knowing their own language or their own uh, tribe or things like that you know it's it's not it's not only at the level of officers at the level of shos or ocs and sdpos and sps only no even if it is at the level of the constable or a sub inspector in the police station if there is a reasonable likelihood of his being prejudiced i think we ought to have a system where we can overcome this prejudice so the, it is it is just about high time where we start start um, having a system where uh, uh, people posted uh in a district are a tribal mix of all the tribes and people who are in a position to take decision which can have long term impacts are not posted to are not given assignments where they can uh, take sides so this is where a beginning can be made uh by by devising a good uh, policy of transfers and postings uh on the other hand if someone administratively if someone acts in a manner which is prejudicial there are there are enough uh, mechanisms within the police manual or the crpc uh, or even in the police uh, uh, disciplinary uh, rules where a person can be prevented from acting in a prejudicial manner uh, sadly we don't uh, sadly we don't uh, um, resort to uh, taking shelter of these manuals again again another thing in nagaland is a society which is in the throes of change those throes of change mean that a person is happier getting posted to his home district or favoring his own uh, clan or a tribe or a village in any other place in the country probably this is something which would be looked down upon in nagaland this is something which is uh, which people are you know, sort of proud to be doing you know i i am proud to be favoring my own clan or my own tribe so this again stems from that old age uh, that ancient mentality that my village is my preserver it is my giver so that we have to break those shackles some day I mean, that will only come away uh, come about through more and more interaction and awareness which we create among people and also building mechanisms where people don't get posted to their home districts or home uh, police stations or important assignments even in other departments not only in police <laughs> i hope uh, i'm able to satisfy you to some extent Hotel yes sir thank you thank you so much now we have uh, another question from uh, this this is coming from dr rimmai longmai yep and uh, he writes special provision with respect to the state of nagaland includes administration of civil and criminal justice involving decisions according to naga customary law is this the reason why many cases were dismissed in the later stage what is the role of the police vis-a-vis the naga customary law courts sir yes you know i would not say that those are the reasons for cases uh, getting dismissed at a later stage uh it's it's in fact the the malaise is uh, deeper than this uh, it is the reason the again nothing against customary law as i said you know uh, i have all respect for customary law and alternate dispute resolution mechanisms but as i said the concept of theft cannot be applied to theft of uh, say internet time that is where the problem comes in you know just because it is a theft of a commodity which is modern again it can uh, customary law i in my in my view cannot be applied to theft of a car because there were no cars customarily you know this is where this is where that paradox comes in this is where that uh, that that difference comes in this is where uh, people are not able to decide which side you should go on this is where people are people find it difficult to uh sort of 
uh, repose faith in the modern law vis a vis the customary law. The nothing against the customary law, but there has to be a distinction between where the customary law starts and where it ends, and where the modern law takes over. You know, so that that is one. Um, aspect that I'm very concerned about. I think uh, even even among Hindus, you know, uh, again, uh, let's let me not talk about Nagas. Let me talk about Hindus. You know, uh, we we don't have that uh, Hindu customary law of uh, criminal justice or a civil justice as such. You know, I mean, not in terms, not in the same terms that as Nagas have. We, yes, we do have, but we have. Our traditions and customs among the Hindus, you know. However, you know, interestingly and uh, probably in a uh, in a better light, I think Hindu traditions and customs have only started getting applied in the modern sense to our own uh, cultural life. I mean, most Hindus sort of have discarded the customary traditional laws and practices in anything else except cultural life you know our traditions and customs are more applicable in case of a birth or a death or a marriage or a, a betrothal ceremony or something well, a customary law of hindus is not applicable for a theft you know customarily a dowry was probably an accepted thing but no hindus realized the dowry is not good so we gave it up and dowry is now become a become a crime you know so this is where uh, but similarly for sati you know um, again i don't mince words similarly for sati for many ages for many years sati got practiced in the country in some parts of the country and it was like revered but people realized that it, it is bad and we gave up and it is now a crime now similarly i think societies like nagaland societies like tribal societies like in, in nagaland and elsewhere also need to probably make a uh, make a distinction between which areas of life of an individual or a society would be governed by customary law and customary practices and where we would start adopting the modern law this is where the transition will come in you know uh, i i is 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 dr rime there Dr. Rimei? Hello. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm here, sir. Yeah, I'm mean, listening to yeah, you, sir. Yeah, I'm, I'm, am, I, am I making myself clear to you on this, what I want to say? You know, there are aspects sir, of. There sir, are, can I just. Sure, please. I will. I just want to add one more point, sir. No, I will. I will. I will come to the policing aspect of it slightly later. But till now, whatever I have said, if you have anything on that count, on in uh, in my answer to your query, uh, please let me know. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I have. I have just one more point, sir. Yeah. Sure, sure. Please. Uh, I'm. I'm satisfied with the explanation that you have yeah, put forward. Yeah, yeah. But one. One thing that uh, uh, perturbs me, uh, yeah. or one thing that worries me. A yes. bit yes. is a uh, little. Um, I don't know because of my unable to inability to understand or not. But it seems that there is uh, there is no there is uh, a need to define. Hmm. You know, uh, you know the contours or the jurisdictions of the customary law you, you as well as of the police. You you yeah. you, you you are hundred percent correct. Uh, I would take the word police out of it in the beginning. I would say, firstly, it is necessary to de define the contours of customary law. Full stop. Policing is a subset of that. You know, <laughs> policing will come a step later. Firstly, we need to define the contours of uh, customary law, and then we need to define what police role is in implementing that customary law. Is it now? Am I slightly clearer now? Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now clearer. No? Yeah. So, so well, firstly, we have to design, uh, define the contours of customary law. You know what? What a customary law can address, what it cannot address. As I said, I may be incorrect, but this is my view. 
and I would reiterate this view that a customary law can only be applied to a thing which existed customarily and traditionally in a society. That would be my broad definition of the contour of a customary law to be applicable, whether it is civil customary law or criminal customary law. A customary law cannot, you know, I mean, okay, let me take it as a step ahead into the civil uh, customary law. Uh, Nagas are Christians, but traditionally Nagas were not Christians. You know, it's it's been, yes, I, I agree, it's been 150 years, 170 years since Christianity uh, came to Nagaland. But before that, customarily, Nagas were not Christians. So you cannot apply customary law to marriages solemnized as per Christian rights. This would be my take, you know. I may be wrong, but I'm, an, I'm just giving an example, you know. Similarly, a theft of a car cannot be settled by theft of uh, by the definition of theft in customary law, because there were no cars earlier. This is the first step. Then the second step is what will be the role of the police? Now, the first uh, way to define role of the police will be customary law. In customary law, the role of police would only be limited to what is defined in the customary law. They cannot do anything else. Secondly, to make things better for an ordinary man, that role of the police in a village or in a tribe or in a society would have to be necessarily interlinked to the role of the police as such. And that interlinkage has to be done through the police outposts or the police stations, which are an extension of the criminal justice system in the country. This is this this dichotomy or this this gap because there is no uh, linkages because there are no linkages is the reason why people don't know where to go where they don't know whether they want to go to the police or they want to go to the traditional institution which which yes they do serve the purpose but they do not serve the entire purpose so uh, th there is Obviously, as you said, there is a need to redefine the contours of customary law. Uh, that definition, again, again, is a very difficult uh, thing to achieve because of the diversity in the society in Nagaland. Uh, but broadly, I would say that uh, define it in a manner that traditionally, cu traditional customary law will only apply to traditional customary items and not to any modern things. I think that will settle things forever. Uh, Thank you. Anyone else, please? Uh, yes, sir. I mean, that's absolutely correct. Because if you see the diversity in our uh, Naga society, oh, yes. so it is very difficult actually to understand, oh, yes. you know, how to find customary law. Oh, yes. Right? It is very difficult. Because, yeah, because for Sangtams, for Changs, and for oh, Angamis, yeah. it's totally different to say, what did a compartmentalization have been done? Or, oh, yes. you know, for the period of thousands of years like that. Exactly. Exactly. So, in this context, so if you take, uh, you know, Dr. Rimmi's, uh, you know, a yeah. uh, proposition ahead about yes. defining the contours of the customary law. So yeah. what do you think, what, what can be done, you know, considering these, uh, uh, you know, the, the diversity, this beautiful diversity. So how it can be tackled? Because ultimately we have to go somewhere, isn't it? Yeah, sir? We have to, we have to see, see, it's, there are, there are various methods. You know, I, 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 I'm not an expert on customary law. I, I, uh, nor do I say that I have too much knowledge. I mean, I, I am I am a generalist who wants good in this society. You know, now it is not for me to define what is customary law. No, but I can lay down broad parameters for most societies. You know, uh, the current law, as per the rules of administration of justice, says five hundred rupees. You know. I think that 500 rupees can be adjusted towards the inflationary trend and make it say 7,000, 8,000, 5,000 rupees, something like that. That could be one. But but you you have to, probably the easiest way is you have to say that customary law will only apply to customary uh, practices. It will not apply to anything to do with the modern concepts of theft and all. You know, 
uh, one of the ways to go about i uh, again as i said earlier in my talk that i visited a few village courts and the washi courts and uh, uh, gb courts and all customary courts i have tried to see the records the records are very sketchy yes they are maintained in some of them the very they are very sketchy i think one of the points of beginning can be to get all those records from all villages and all district courts and village courts where the cases have been decided by the dcs or their assistants or by the dubashis or uh, village courts have them compiled village by village and district by village by village subdivision by sub subdivision and district by district if you go if you if you if we do that exercise i mean again i am not trying to lay down any parameters i'm just saying how i could envisage a solution like this when you compile a list of all this say across about say 2000 or uh, 2000 odd villages in nagaland we will get a list of subjects a list of topics in which decisions have been taken by customary laws uh, according to customary laws you know those would broadly define the areas where customary laws would apply apply you know customary law will not apply to something which is new customary law will apply to something which existed so we are going to compile let us compile all those cases let us also try to compile the punishments or the resolutions of mechanisms adopted in all that and the resolution like whether the fine the, the fine could have been any anywhere between a pig a pig to say two pigs or three pigs or like whatever giving a goat or something like that you know all those could be combined and the 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 lower limits and the upper limit limits of the fines and the punishments could be incorporated in some sort of a law for various different types of categories like for example like theft of uh, theft of paddy so in one village someone stole say one tin of paddy and he was given a punishment of say he has to return one tin and say feed someone for 5 days okay fine good you know in another village for the same tina he was fined say two uh, tinas of paddy and say feed 10 people so you can easily say between if for every one tina or two tinas so the maximum limit of an article of theft is two tinas and the max minimum punishment is return of that tina and the maximum punishment is feeding of say five people or 10 people you know so all this exercise can be undertaken but i am nobody to lay down a limit but yes that limit has to be laid down in consultation with everybody with with most people in the society with most stakeholders in the society taking into account a very important factor very very important factor the most important factor is anyone in the society whether it is in the customary laws or even now anyone in the society who is exercising control or power of any over anything will not be willing to cede even an inch from what he has already ex exercised so you have to be willing to take something away from him by pushing him to the corner that this is like this if he is if he has used that power or someone has used that power once in say 50 years you can can easily be taken away because next 50 years he will never use it you know so anyone who has exercised any power will not be willing to give away any authority that he has exercised so there are a few bottom lines which are going to be there those bottom lines should be defined and then the rest could be left to uh, uh the details the details can be left you know you can define that only this much and not more for example you can easily say if there is a theft of more than 10 tinas of rice it will get reported to the district uh, to the uh, straight to the police of uh, police station and uh, the judicial magistrates so we could have a, a scaled list of items on how we can define uh, uh, the uh, crimes and sir what about the cases of rapes and molestations now these are already defined rapes and molestations and all as per laws of criminal justice uh, are all defined as heinous crimes they have to be reported to the police no, no, I, 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 i agree i agree. but my my point is something else because yeah. sir of course i mean we have provisions uh, for offense sexual offenses we have yeah. provision in ip you know offenses against body you know yeah. we understand that even yeah. for the murder you know culpable homicide amounting not amounting right. to murder we have that. but my question is that yeah. uh 
well i will not take the names but mm. i have traveled quite a lot in nagaland yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, i have heard some instances wherein mm. the molestations have happened yeah. you know wherein uh, some some rape cases have also happened yeah. but both cases have not been you know reported to the police and some sort of settlement have been done oh, yeah. of course oh, yeah. i don't know oh, yeah. details of uh, you know those cases but this is what i heard i'm sure you must have also yeah, yeah, come across happened. that kind of uh, you know uh, the crimes so as a police officer and also you know as uh, someone uh, who is a law abiding citizen what 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 would you tell people and how would you uh, make them aware about the law why people are not coming forward even to report such cases like I molestation know. i don't understand that see i i i uh, understand what I, what you are trying to uh, say firstly even as per the existing rules for administration of justice there is something which is called a heinous crime okay a rape is defined as a heinous crime even if even in the rules for administration of justice rape is a heinous crime and it says if a heinous crime takes place in the jurisdiction of any village any village officer who may be charged with the duty of arresting criminals shall arrest the person and inform the district authorities you know so there is already a duty cast on the villagers to do this however this duty is not followed this is because the alternate dispute resolution mechanisms are strong and the people in the villages as i said you know when i said that there is a need to impart training the people who are uh who are given the duty of village courts or dubashis or village headmen or khelenja or gaumudas they are not even aware of their duties if i i think the state government should take initiative to impart training uniform training in all these matters to all the village headmen and the khelen charges or the gaumudas and all this is your duty if you fail to do this we will take action against you you know one of the actions can be that they could be removed from their positions which the state government has the power to do it the other the other action could be they could be charged with conspiracy for destruction of evidence and for not reporting crimes on the uh, this so this is this is one aspect of it where the lack of training and awareness has created problems where people should be encouraged to report crimes the people who are duty bound should report crimes on the other hand we come to a situation where a rape is not reported now my question is as a policeman what is my duty is it not my duty to find out if a crime has taken place yes it is so this is where i said that if there are only 5 cases or 10 cases being registered in a police station is it not the duty of the police officer in the police station to go around to the villages and meet the people and once in a while so you do it once in 15 days 10 days meet the villages meet the village head man village the, uh, meet the village council members uh, village meet the uh, gamburas and ask them what is happening in the village if he goes there and if he ask what is happening in the village he will have a better understanding of what is happening in the village he will have a better understanding of the security and crime situation in the village so it is it is a complex question but here we are in in nagaland we are in a situation where policing in the modern sense of the word is still taking roots it's still taking shape so there are there are issues which need to be resolved but these issues need to be addressed over a period of time one odd effort to uh, address these issues will not make a difference now if people are not Uh, reporting crimes i remember a case where a murder case had been registered i mean uh, let me give this instance to you there was a case in uh, peren where uh, where i learned that someone um, has been killed and he's been buried and i asked my oc i said go and check what has happened and he said oh sorry to mari dishe to manuge i said why he said he was a drug addict and his family members spent their entire money on his uh, treatment uh when they were not able to do it the village council sat together and decided that this fellow is an idiot um, he, he is a nuisance to the society and we should kill him so the village council decided to kill him and it didn't get reported to us 
If someone told me somewhere, we registered a case of murder, I mean, again, what happened in that case of murder would be a different issue. We did arrest a few people in that, but those people got bailed out because the social milieu is different. The village has decided we will kill him and it is finished. No, but it is a murder. You know, so I, I think the society sh should be less and less tolerant about crimes being handled, criminal cases being handled in an informal manner. And this doesn't apply only to Nagaland, this applies to all societies. I mean, wherever there is a crime taking place, it should be handled formally. Thank you. Anyway, Thank you so much. Uh, there is one question from our ex student, Kukha Chofi. Yeah, Kukha. Uh, yeah, we'll address him. Uh, in the context of Nagaland, recent cases during this lockdown, certain cases were triggered brutality by police over the doctors. And the ultimate solution was forgiveness. Sir, should that be an attitude towards the law and order? Why was there no punishment or the crime recorded? Why there is such ignorance in the society? What is your view, sir? Sir, if you could remember that there was yeah, a case yeah, happened. There were two, two, three cases like this. Yeah, yes. Kuka, you know, again, I think partly you answered uh, uh, the question that you put. Why is there uh, so much ignorance in the society? I think part of it is because of ignorance. Uh, however, during stress times like these, uh, I think probably forgiveness is a good thing to do. Uh, you cannot have police and uh, doctors at loggerheads uh, uh, over issues which are which, which could finally turn out to be uh, non-issues. It could just be ego hassles between two people. You know, as I said, anyone um, who is exercising any power will find it very difficult to give away any of his authority. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what happened in these cases, but you know, uh, the society needs to respect the police. Even if it is a constable and he's a grade three or a grade four employee, when, when he is in uniform, he needs to be, he ought to be given the respect that he deserves. On the other hand, a police officer in uniform, whether he's a constable or a, or an IG or a DG or whoever, needs to have adequate respect for the person across. You know, whether it is a doctor or someone else. However, the deciding factor should be who is the violator of the law. If there was a violation by the doctor, I'm not saying, I, I'm not going into the facts of the case, but if there was a case where if if the doctor was drunk or the doctor was driving hazardly, hazardously, hazardously or his vehicle was parked on the wrong side or if the policeman stopped his vehicle and asked him to come out of the vehicle and this person misbehaved. Now, there could be many instances. Those are things which cannot be condoned. You know, the the ordinary man needs to know the law as much as a policeman and ignorance of law by a police uh, by a by a civilian is no excuse however all said and done you know uh, i think uh, those issues which cropped up i think got sorted out amicably because ultimately because of the forgiveness but i think there need to be protocols in place uh, where uh, uh, police officers you know in this instance being I mean, i'm myself a cop so i would uh, suggest something to my police friends that sentences like this uh, I'm not saying with the doctor but with anyone any mishap happening with you with a police officer on duty anywhere in the country you need to report it up the chain you know it is for your own safety and security so that there are no allegations so for a police officer it is good that anything which goes with you when you are on duty it should be reported immediately in writing to your next senior so that he reports it up the channel before anything goes wrong on the other hand for a civilian if there is any infarction anything any wrongdoing by a uh, by a policeman on duty i think the civilian should report it to the next senior officer of the person who sort of misbehaved in writing immediately there is no other way you can handle these things because once the facts are there then these issues can be addressed uh, easily 
there is no point in having a situation where a doctors association uh, goes on a strike or wants to go on a strike uh, and the police officers start taking up uh, uh, hard positions over an issue which involves just two in individuals or three individuals it is it is best to localize incidents like this and handle it at that level rather than um, allowing things to go out of control and the, these like uh, becoming big issues which actually don't deserve the attention that they do, uh, uh, should be kuka i hope Thank you. If i'm okay with that uh guka i hope you have got uh, your answer uh can you said you you had one question right can you can you can you hear me can you said you if you have any question you can ask to sir or anybody else if there is any other question we yes. can yes yeah can you hello am I, am i audible yeah. yes 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 yeah, can we oh yeah um yeah thank you so much sir for being here today uh for your insightful talk and your thoughts on uh policing um i would uh it's not exactly a question but i would like uh to have your view on this that um it's quite a revelation that you know uh you talk about the uh primary identity of the nagas uh, being in the village um i um was reading this book by uh edited by jl jp uh hill jp rooters nagas in the mm -hmm. 21st century uh which has uh along with uh which states that um the village identity that is uh you know uh, attached with the nagas mm -hmm. is yeah. it brings about the social consciousness so mm -hmm. can we uh, derive back our all the talks that we have done over here on the issues and problems or the solutions to be uh you know addressed at the village level at first so that later on we could bring out think of the development or a sort of solution being implemented at the state level thank you yeah can okay, yeah, i i think yes you are right i mean unfortunately for me i haven't read uh, jp uh, hill but this is my view based on my observations in nagaland over so many years uh but it's glad to know that uh, jp hill and i am both of us are on the same page uh i think you did quite you a know? job of anthropologist <laughs> <laughs> no it's just observation i think uh, it was surprising I was, i was surprised to have to to come across that yeah yeah but you know it's based on observation i've been observing nagas over a period of time uh uh no the see uh, village identity is important uh uh probably a lot of uh, the dispute resolution can take place at the village uh, it does take place at the village however this needs to be formalized you know you cannot leave it the way it is you would need to uh, you means the government of the day the governments need to lay down the uh, the the lower and the upper limits for the categories of cases whether it is civil or criminal in which the village authorities can exercise their jurisdiction or their powers if those are not laid down clearly uh, we will keep having problems uh, the other thing is we need to bring about some degree of uniformity in uh, uh, the parameters that we laid down Uh, yes the degree of uniformity may be very difficult to achieve because most of the villages sort of functioned as independent republics so uh, there would there would be differences but broadly they could be they, they could be they could be uniformity for example punishment can be anywhere between one day uh, say in in uh, in 10 villages of for example in mokokchung punishments may vary from one day to 20 days so you can easily have it like one to 20 days for mokokchung and say 20 days to 25 days for zoneboto something like that and ultimately government can lay down one not more than 30 days you know 
I'm just giving an example. I'm not uh, uh, really uh, quoting uh, any existing law or anything. So there could be upper and lower limits of uh, uh, where the law can be exercised. That is one aspect. Uh, yes, the development um, uh, thing can be taken out of context, but development is also very important because all these laws um, and the village, uh, all these laws and customary practices have existed in the past because of relative isolation of people from each other. You know, that, that isolation is slowly getting finished. Uh, so there is, there is a need to have more and more uniformity. Um, and uh, uh, since people are moving and more technology is coming, I, I think that we need to take more and more things out of the realm of uh, being sorted out at the village level and more and more things to be sorted out in a formal manner. Now, uh, as a go-between, what can be done is that we could have a system, as I said, that where we could define the lower and the upper limits of what can be addressed at the village level and what should not be addressed by the village level. There could also be a situation where certain things which are addressed by the village level do not have a final authority unless they are confirmed at some other level, which is can be at the district level or a uh, uh, subdivisional level. So there are various mechanisms which could be put in place, uh, but village village level is important. Village level is the one where uh, uh, people do listen to even now. Although this structure is uh, with more and more better transport mechanisms coming in, I think these structures will uh, break down quite fast. I think in the next 20 years or so, it will break down very fast. Uh, and this is not the case only with Nagaland. I often quote my example. I'll give you my example again. You know, uh, I've given this example a few times in a few of my talks earlier, but I will happily quote it again, uh, even now. Uh, my my father is from a small village in Haryana. Till the time my mother, uh, my grandmother was alive, which was till late uh, 1980s. We used to visit our village, uh, me and my parents and uh, my brothers and sisters. We used to visit uh, our village almost every year. Uh, my grandmother probably, uh, we lost her in 89-90. After that, uh, my father and mother used to visit the village uh, once in two, three years when there is some function in the family. Uh, I visited my village, used to visit my village once in about seven, eight years or something. And now, since uh, my father is still there, my parents are there, but he's lost his brothers. So we just have our first cousins there in the village. The last time I visited my village was in to June to, in uh, January 2019, which was after a gap of almost 16, 17 years. Now, I don't find it surprising. Uh, I think this is the way it will happen in Nagaland also, where uh, more and more people of the next generations will go less and less frequently to the villages. So the power of the of the village courts will naturally get reduced. Uh, it is also therefore incumbent on them to them to realize this aspect uh, that I mean, uh, sanity holds in their uh, giving away some of their powers to the normal formal system so that the formal system at least get established. Um, yes, uh, temporarily we can continue with the village system, but I think the formal systems would finally have to find a place in the society. I hope I'm, uh, I've satisfied you with this answer. Kinney? Kenya, I hope you got your answer and you're satisfied. If you uh, have any yes, other questions. Thank you please. so much. Uh, sir, one thing I really like uh, what you said, you basically uh, gave, uh, uh, gave a history of human civilization in a very nutshell by saying the fact that one day or the other, you know, your allegiance to the village uh, is gradually going to go down. Oh, yes. Same thing yeah, in interest. my case also. Yeah, same yes. thing happened in my case also. So this is this is the factual reality. Oh, yes. uh, now, sir, reality. Uh, we are almost yeah, we are now almost at the uh, end of uh, our program. If there is uh, no other question, I will take an opportunity to ask the last question to you, sir, and that sure, is please. the way forward. The way forward. 
considering the fact that number one people are not aware about the laws number two even if they are aware about the laws they are under village pressures number three relationship between the civil administration the police administration and the common man and the fourth important point is awareness so in this dynamics where do you see uh, you know uh, where do you see uh, this uh, naga society can go and in society like this what should be the role of academic institutions the colleges and universities in uh, in spreading awareness about the law of the land about the constitution about the basic rights of the people sir hmm. your take yeah a teacher will never fail to be a teacher uh so you asked the last question on that topic uh can i ask you something uh, dr anirudh do you have law llb uh, yes sir. yes sir i was a as a practicing have... advocate no but, no, but uh, in the techo college are you giving a degree in law also no no sir no sir no sir i i belong to department of political science uh, so you know uh, since since you are not having a llb you know one of uh, how dearly i would love to do this you know uh, it is my dream to do this now how and dream to do this in nagaland now how how well we can do it will all depend on a partnership uh, with uh, educational institutions uh, and that could be that during uh, holidays the students do a sort of a, uh, a program which is about 15 to 20 days not at a stretch but like in gaps you can you can even do it in say over a period of say one week in the beginning where we can uh, when the students or the colleges or the educational institutions in uh, coordination with the uh, nagaland legal services authority and uh, the state police we could make uh, powerpoint presentations and uh, slides on uh, various aspects of law i mean civil law criminal law criminal jurisprudence criminal acts and everything and teams of 2 to 3 students could travel around to the villages and create awareness among people about uh, the modern law uh, i think that would help immensely because if you are having about you know we can we can we can pitch in through the police and uh, we can pitch in through the state government also but um, uh, these two institutions they are handicapped because of the work that they are normally doing but if, imagine if we have about say 2000 more students who were only to do this and those students in term in teams of 2 to 3 could go to the villages so we have like about 700 being uh, villages being covered at the same time throughout the state i think this could be a massive achievement uh, of sorts uh, if we can do this this would help bring uh help create awareness among people this would also help bring people to the modern side of law to the uh, uh, uh to the formalized system of law this could also help in teaching people in the villages the village courts and the gaon bodas and the khel in charges and all about what are their powers and what they can do and what they cannot do this could also help unearth crimes like you have said where there is a case of a rape or a molestation which has taken place in a village and it is never got, got reported you know so th this could actually be a, a booster dose for the formal policing and criminal justice system in uh, in in nagaland i wonder if uh, uh, the chio college can do a partnership uh, either with nagaland police formally or i mean you want my help i can personally engage with you uh, we could draw up a list of about say 15 20 or topics uh, we could develop slides uh, and since you are a law graduate yourself and between you and me we can do about say 20 25 uh, powerpoint presentations on various topics you could at your end train some of the students who would be interested in doing an internship we could have a, a separate uh, certificate uh, being issued from uh, from the college for this we could all we would also talk to the nagaland university and get us a certificate instituted for this for about a, say 15 in 10 days 
uh, internship program like this so they could so they could be uh, endless number of methods where we could intervene uh, in this uh, uh, if i think of anything else and if you have anything else in mind i think we could both work together to achieve uh, something better than we have uh, achieved till now I well 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 I'm... well you actually made me smile you know you actually made me smile because this is something that can really create a positive impact in our society and uh, tetso college is all about creating positive impact in the society in the interest of the present as well as future generation of the nagar sir i promise you uh, we will definitely uh, work on it and one more thing is uh, i had a uh, discussion with my director and he also told me that he is also interested in setting up a law school in tetso so one day this okay. will also yeah so so one day this will also be a reality and uh, for your information a uh, couple of students who have uh, passed out this year for the department of political they have joined law courses as well right oh, so somewhere oh, there is hope somewhere there is a positive message in the society ah sir oh, yeah. thank you so much for your time thank you we have thank you thank you very uh, much two, two long hours sir thank you thank you so much thank you very much thanks uh, a lot I, i'm sure there would be many more questions but unfortunately you know we could not take more questions because of the concern of the time no issues please do keep in touch and if i can be of any help please let me know thank you very much oh sure, sure, sure. thank you thank you so much thank have you. a great thank evening you. thank you guys for this wonderful and thank you everyone welcome. for listening in. and uh, and dr anirudh uh, just a last thing yeah please uh, can you get a transcript of this made i think google meet has a facility for transcripting the entire thing for oh, that that our it department will do sir they are, they are recording everything everything is being recorded properly yeah. and uh, transcript and the recording everything will be given to you sir and it will also be on the youtube uh, no and and also a transcript it can all be right written down i my wife she is taking online classes and she says that the entire thing can be transcripted it can be written down in a conversation manner also so if if that facility oh, is oh, yeah. yeah if that can be done uh, if i can have a copy of that also it will be great Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. sure. I'll talk with my IT guys, sir. I'll yeah. get it done, yeah. sir. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank, thank you so much. You want to say bye, 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 everybody. Thank you thank so you much. much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank evening. you very much. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you.